You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law, and with me, yet again, my co-host, Paul Doroshenko. Hey, Kyla. How are you doing? I am very stressed. Are you? You said this was the slower time of the year for Driving Law, but no, it's not the slower time of the year, nor is it just generally slow with the amount of work we have to do. Well, we don't have traffic court, but yeah, we, I guess we don't have business, traffic court, but there's we've still got lots of work. five judicial reviews in the next seven days. Yeah. Explain that. Well, that's what happens when there's some time in court. You know, for the last few months, you haven't been, last few months, last few years, you haven't been able to get uh, hearing dates in BC Supreme Court. And now uh, here you are if it's, uh, there's always a judge available because there's no trials being conducted right now. This is correct. So <laughs> instead of being able to count on things falling apart, I now have to count on things going ahead. Yeah. Um, which is fun. Anyway, there's been lots of driving law in the news this week, and we are strangely starting off with, I guess, a ridiculous driver of the week. But it's not our ridiculous driver of the week. Well, because he did it last year, or because, you know, why, why would he not be? I think he is. Because I'm saving the other person that we're going to talk about as our ridiculous driver. Okay. But we are talking about Alberta's former justice minister. Yeah, so he's got a uh, big problem because he seems to think that he uh, can hang on. And it's very strange what's going on there. Yeah, so, so give us the rundown, Paul. Well, his name is Casey uh, Madu or Maydu. I haven't heard it on the radio. I've only read about this, and I've been monitoring this for some time. This is the fellow who's been responsible for the changes to uh, Alberta's traffic court system. He is there justice minister, so equivalent of uh, attorney general, and I think he holds the same job as solicitor general, and uh, he is widely not liked for a number of reasons, and people have some fairly good uh, reasons, but they're mostly political, but this is not so political. He got a tra uh, traffic ticket mm -hmm. for using his cell phone at 9.30 in the morning in a school zone. So pretty bad to start with uh, when Isn't we talk that how about someone got convicted of dangerous driving, causing bodily harm. That woman who was using her cell phone in a school zone and she wasn't watching and she ran over that kid in the crosswalk and then the kid ended up with like life altering paralysis injuries. Well, that would do it. I mean, in B.C., it's considered a high risk offense and it's uh, it's a heavy duty offense. It's four demerits uh, in Alberta. The offense is not attracted quite so much attention as what he did afterward. And we're not talking the same day when he's still upset about the ticket. Several days later, he phones the chief of police in Edmonton about the ticket. And, of course, this doesn't come out. It didn't come out until there was a, This was a long time ago, I think in March or something, that he, he got this ticket. But it didn't come out until this week when CBC revealed it, that this is what took place. And how this has played out in the last week is fascinating. So um, first thing that we uh, learned, of course, was that there was this phone call made and there was a denial immediately that it was for a purpose of getting the ticket dropped. That's irrelevant. Of course, the issue is that it's improper to, of him to phone the police from his position as justice minister uh, regardless, I mean, it's not the channel that you ever take you know, as any individual, and this is using your position of of authority over this in in the justice system. Okay, well, let me play devil's advocate for a second here. The justice minister is black, over policing by the I believe it was the Edmonton police that pulled him over over policing of black people in Edmonton was a significant issue that he was in fact considering. And at the time, he had also given a direction to the chief of police in Edmonton to look into systemic racism against the black community in, in Edmonton by the police and the way that they were being over-policed. And the police chief had essentially done nothing about it. And then you have a black justice minister who's trying to get the police to engage in these types of inquiries when the police are resisting him, 
being pulled over and issued a ticket, valid or not, are there not legitimate concerns there that this is just a continuation of that and potentially retaliation? Phone call, Kyla? Yeah. A phone call? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think so. You're the justice minister. It would be the same as if you were a judge phoning the chief of police. The implication is, or the suggestion is, first of all, that he can phone the chief, the chief of police well, and I, get the guy on the line. I can phone secondly, the chief of police. He's secondly, not going to talk yeah. to me. But. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, yeah, you can too. Um, I probably secondly, could. yeah, I know you could, but <laughs> you probably listen. Secondly, the Hi, chief of police. <laughs> the uh, who knows? There might be a chief of police. Um, you know, is he going to tear up the ticket? Is it a discussion about um, the fact that the chief of police has not liked traffic court and overtime that officers have had? And I'll eliminate traffic court maybe for you if you tear up this ticket. Can you make sure that I don't get another one of these things in the future? Even if none of those things are discussed, those are the things that are conveyed and implied. And you know and I know what happens to a police officer if they're pulled over and they say, oh yeah, I'm a member. Um, Although you know, they're and in pipe up and do that. Kind of a catch twenty two because in some circumstances they're also obligated to identify themselves as a member. It's yes. how they do it that raises yes. the concerns. Yes, of course. So um, this is, uh, uh, I would say, a significant, significant problem. And uh, I mean, I, I won't go into how it could play out from this point on, but I did say on Twitter that uh, he would be resigning by noon the following day when this came out. Um, he was he lost his particular position with this uh, portfolio that night, mm -hmm. so about an hour after I tweeted that. Um, and somebody else was given the job, and now there's an investigation. And of course, Jason Kenney says it's going to be an independent investigation. And with the conservatives in Alberta, you cannot assume that anything's uh, going to be independent. It's probably going to be Matt Wolf who conducts the uh, investigation. In any event, yeah. everybody is now calling for him to resign. You can imagine if anybody did this in any other province by now, they would have resigned. And uh, it seems to be just merely the arrogance of the uh, of Jason Kenney and his his party that's at like 22% in the polls, um, knowing full well that even at 22%, They'll probably get reelected in Alberta. Yeah, but Paul, um, what happened with the ticket? Did he take it to court, fight it, argue the system? Well, that's the other thing. Racism? So he paid the ticket. After the phone call. After the phone call. In other words, uh, the suggestion is, oh, so I'm going to have to pay this ticket, eh? Okay, you're not going to do something for me. Oh, maybe he phoned up and he said, look, I'm going to plead guilty to this ticket. I totally did it. But, like, here was the problem with the interaction and how it went and why my perception was. And this is what we've been talking about. Well, now, after he's paid the ticket, Kyla, he's saying that he's innocent. He thinks he didn't commit an offense. What was he doing? Well, he says he wasn't using his phone. Yeah, but how many so people he, say they weren't using yeah, their phone? Exactly. So he had an option. He could have gone to court and fought it out. Um, he also told the police officer there at the roadside who he was, which is, again, another attempt to, to curry favor uh, or would, it, it would give the impression. Or perhaps it's a way impression. of saying, I'm not the person you're stereotyping me to be. Yep. Maybe well, you say that to protect your safety. Like you don't know. You're you're white. I'm white passing. You don't know what it's like to be a person with dark skin pulled over by a police officer and accused of something. You don't know how much terror does or doesn't go through their minds. But if anything from what I'm watching on stories on television that are dealing with this in popular media now, people are worried. Yeah, and if you're the justice minister, you quietly take your ticket and then you resolve it in with the remedies that are available in court. But you don't know, but no, because you might feel as though if you don't tell them I'm not in a gang or I'm not involved in crime or I'm not whatever you think the officer's perceiving you to be, that you're going to be subject to violence, rough treatment, that you could be shot or killed. He's pulled over and issued a traffic ticket for using a cell phone yeah, in a school zone at 9 at 9:30 in the morning. Black kids are he's walking a, down the street he's a in lawyer, broad daylight and lawyer shot to in death his by police. 40s or 50s. I so what? He doesn't look mm. like a lawyer in his 40s and 50s necessarily in that moment. Well, he does in every photo of him. Well, yeah, cuz he but, all the photos of him know, are in press conferences in his capacity as justice A lot minister. of people, a lot of people are pointing out that he's playing the race card. 
And I think there's a, a valid argument to be made that he's playing the race card when he's done something that is absolutely abhorrent, making this phone call. The comment that he makes to the police officer at the roadside, you can forgive that. But this phone call, we're talking days later when he's had a chance to cool down, when he's had a chance to think about it and had a chance to consider his legal options, and he's a lawyer and could have phoned a lawyer and had a lawyer deal with it, could have discussed it with the cabinet ministers. I got this ticket. Uh, you know, I don't know that it was, but I think our government should be investigating this. I, you know, accept that I got this ticket or I'm going to defend this ticket. No, he phoned the chief of police, who is a supporter of the Conservative Party in Alberta. He's been seen at their events and has has uh, made public comments in support of them. Well, that's a problem for the chief of police. Well, that's because they're pals. So he phoned his pal, the chief of police. Now, what was said and what was discussed, we don't know. There'll be an investigation. There'll be questions asked. Can they still recall with some reliability? You know, I don't know. You know, but, you know who we but, need? But, you know. You know who we need? Who? You watched the season finale of Curb Your Enthusiasm. What? Who do we need? That guy from the Trump tapes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vindeman. Yeah, we need Vindeman. It's a perfect phone call. Where, where's, um, <laughs> where's Vindeman when you need him? The, um, <laughs> so, the, uh, will they get to the bottom of it? One cannot say, I think, but um, apparently this fellow told fellow cabinet ministers, and they joked about it, and all thought it was funny at the time. And I bet Jason Kenney knew it at the time. And that's going to be interesting if that plays out because now he's extremely disappointed in his minister and has given him a different job. But of course, won't fire him because he can't, you know, he's in perpetual denial and actually doesn't give a shit about the justice system as far as I can tell, Jason Kenney that is. Um, and uh, really is uh, holds the people of Alberta in contempt and thinks they're idiots and, and is of the belief that this will just be another thing that, that blows past them. Um, but uh, I still think he qualifies, Kyle, as the ridiculous driver of the week because think about this. He's in a school zone. He is a minister of the government. He is the justice minister. And he's using his cell phone in a school zone. That is ridiculous. Maybe he was making an emergency call. Maybe. Anyway. Okay, well, moving on from our lively debate about the Justice Minister, in which I'm mostly playing the devil's advocate, because obviously I don't think that you should just pick up the phone and call the chief of police, and if I got a ticket, I would not call the chief of police, who maybe listens to this podcast. Um, well, the other thing is, like, things, you know, you make mistakes in life, and sometimes you're wrongly accused, and sometimes <laughs> you can be very upset, and, I mean, you're... you're your option is to deal with the justice system, and sometimes you're going to lose, and sometimes, you know, okay. that's just what you got to deal with. Okay, on that note, this is driving law related. I was researching for an argument because I was writing an argument today um, on a, uh, a, a speeding ticket appeal that I'm dealing with. And as I was researching some cases, I came upon this old case from the BC Court of Appeal from 1990. Now, this is that's a, old, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is old. And you'll see why it's old in a moment. In uh, in this case, it's Garrity. And Garrity, as you, you and I have talked about before on this podcast, is actually quite a famous case because the case establishes two things um, with respect to speeding tickets. First of all, it establishes... Um, uh, it establishes... Um, um, some issues with respect to the uh, constitutional validity of certain provisions of um, the um, penalties, uh, but it also uh, is important because it establishes what must be proven as far as the measurement of, of speed uh, using a laser or a radar device, and it's still good law in mm -hmm. respect of that. But Mr. Garrity appealed his case after he was convicted for a photo radar ticket in 1990 to the Court of Appeal. And little known background about this case, Mr. Garrity was a lawyer. And so he did this appeal. He hired a, his own lawyer to handle it. And he brought it before the court. And he was actually successful 
in his appeal, um, and uh, um, the appeal was allowed and his conviction was quashed, um, and the legislation was amended and didn't exist anymore, um, but they still wanted to express their opinion on the constitutional validity of it at the time, because there was the potential that you could get jail for it. Despite the fact that he won, uh, one of the justices who is not named in the judgment says this, and I had a great laugh when I read this today. I have had the privilege of reading in draft the reasons for judgment of Mr. Justice Wood. For the reasons he gives, I agree that we are bound by authority to allow this appeal. But I cannot, uh, but, I cannot but express my regret at this result for these reasons. First, there was never any practical possibility that the appellant would be imprisoned for this offense, no matter who was driving. I have never heard of anyone in British Columbia being imprisoned for a speeding offense as such, nor, for that matter, for any other offense against which the traffic regulation provisions of the Motor Vehicle Act apply. Secondly, this exercise in constitutional haddockery has occupied a trial judge, a county court judge sitting in appeal, and three judges of this court. I do not know how many days of judicial time have been so consumed, but I think it must be at least five. Additionally, it has required the services of two Crown Council court clerks and court reporters. Not only does this cost of does the cost of all of this, which must be at least five thousand dollars, lol, because now it'd be like a couple hundred thousand dollars. Wow, well, yeah, probably twenty five or thirty anyway. Come from the public purse, i.e., from all the appellant's fellow citizens, but other litigants will have been delayed thereby. Every person who takes a place he does not need in the queue of litigation and insists on services from the legal system harms his fellow citizen who is behind him in the queue. Thirdly, and this is the part that what you just said reminded me of this case, whatever happened to the precept that one should take one's punishment like a man? Somebody who had possession of the vehicle, a BMW, with the appellant's consent, drove it considerably over the speed limit on the Stanley Park Causeway in rush hour, and the appellant, a lawyer, should have been man enough to take the punishment for letting such a person drive, i.e. pay the sum of $75, which does not, to me, seem to be beyond the financial capacity of the owner of such a motor vehicle, even if the driver, whoever he or she was, was not prepared to reimburse him. Well, I'm with the judge on part of it. It's funny, the uh, years ago... I'm not. That's so sexist. Years Take ago, your punishment well, like a man. man. Well, not the man part, but the you know the rest of it. But the uh, uh, I find an interesting thing there is discrimination against BMW drivers, which is <laughs> a, a real thing, and it is a legitimate thing, and I've experienced it in the court system myself where prosecutors have been hammering the table. He was driving a BMW. The suggestion is he's driving a BMW, therefore he he's must so be wealthy, he must be wealthy, A, and be aggressive. Uh, BMWs are, are a dime a dozen. There's, they're, they're, the, you can buy a BMW for the same price as you can buy a Toyota, and a Toyota is a better car. Um, but uh, I also think that, the, uh, that many of these steps of the judicial process are a complete waste of time and money. Think, for example, about an appeal from provincial court of a summary matter. It goes from a provincial court judge, usually a brilliant judge. Many of the provincial court judges are really, really wise. They know the law. They're dealing with it all the time. They're smart. They write good judgments. And they are dealing with this type of law all the time, these legal issues. And then if it's appealed, you go to from one judge to another judge. Just another judge at BC Supreme Court. Not just another judge. They're paid about $100,000 more. They're paid more, but they're not better educated. They don't have any different judginess. They often don't deal with these types of things. A lot of them have some corporate legal experience, but they have no uh, experience or history hearing cross-examinations of, of people who come to traffic court or people who are dealing with criminal matters or people, you know, the, the, the regular folk, they're often corporate lawyers who dealt with corporate law and then become a, and maybe corporate litigation, and then are appointed directly to BC Supreme Court. Without that, that uh, history, they're no better or better placed than the provincial court judge. They're both judges. One of the, you know, and so here we have this whole step of appeals that is really, in my mind, ridiculous. It should just go straight to the court of appeal. And going to the Court of Appeal should be easier. 
You shouldn't have to file as much stuff. You should be able to file the transcript. You should be able to file a one-page argument and then go in there and make your argument. Instead, we've got these ridiculous rules that make it so complex. Um, there's no reason it should go to a BC Supreme Court judge as an uh, appeal. Uh, it should go straight from provincial court to, uh, to the Court of Appeal, in my view. And that was a good example of where it's that huge waste, right? Starts in provincial court, goes to Supreme Court, ends up at the Court of Appeal, all for a speeding ticket. You think that it should go straight to the Court of Appeal and occupy three judges at $330,000 a year? Yeah, yeah. So you think it's better just to have one judge who's no in no better place than the well, original they, judge? People give up. No, just go straight to Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal should be easy for summary offenses. It should be. It shouldn't be that expensive, and I don't care if it's three judges you know at three hundred thousand dollars a year. A factum? Yeah, and that's why I think they should be easier. I think they should be a simpler thing. I think it's it's made overly complex for no damn good reason, and it's like the judges at the court of appeal shouldn't aren't aren't so pristine and perfect that they can't deal with a factum that's not perfect. You know, I mean, I, we can talk about that one from Alberta. Um, <laughs> the uh, case of the uh, factum being sent back, um, <laughs> uh, perhaps on another day, it's not driving law, but I, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's making it, we see no refinement and no improvement in the justice system in my entire career, uh, except maybe the Civil Resolution Tribunal. I don't know, people who act with, you know, with that regularly might feel differently, but I just see it uh, as, as way too much. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, speaking of case law, there's been some other kind of funny case law this week. What's up? Um, well, there was a great case. It was kind of an appeal of a traffic ticket, also involving a camera speed allegation. Oh, is this the, uh... This is the case of Tran. So in Tran, it's actually a judgment on whether or not there should be an adjournment of the appeal. Mr. Tran was issued a camera ticket for speeding um, and allegedly was not driving his car. And so he, um, uh, he disputed the ticket and he had an agent appear for him in traffic court. Now an agent in traffic court is not a lawyer, but somebody who I guess help, is supposed to help you represent yourself in traffic court, but instead, the agent effectively represented him in traffic court, potentially practicing law. And this was a particular problem because... Because it was Sheldon. So Sheldon Goldberg. Sheldon Goldberg um, was a uh, lawyer in British Columbia, and he was notorious. And he was around uh, 222 Main Street a lot when I first started practicing, and he was there for years. And he was uh, an interesting character, <laughs> Uh, I kind of liked him. Uh, a lot of people didn't like him. Uh, he did some things that I can tell you no other lawyer would think was appropriate. Yeah, no well, other lawyer I knew. Because I've tried to Google this and yeah. haven't figured it out. All I know is he didn't show up to court, and also Judge Godfrey gave him a lifetime ban. From her courtroom. Um, well, that was, uh, I think, um, one time where he was running two trials at the same time in two different courtrooms. <laughs> and he was just, uh, excuse me, I just have to go to the washroom and then running to the next courtroom, and <laughs> popping in and <laughs> conducting a few minutes worth of trials. I watched him conduct some trials and I felt his clients were not properly represented, um, which was a uh, you know, painful thing to watch because he, um, he, he it didn't look like he had prepared. He would just read through the police report when he was uh, cross-examining. He wouldn't even really cross-examine him. He would be asking the police officer, so what did you do then? What what happened after that? What did you do then? So it was like he did, wasn't conducting a cross-examination. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll tell you, I had clients who were in custody who, uh, you know, fired me in and went to hire Sheldon because uh, he had so many clients who were in the pretrial center that they all knew each other and they'd keep talking about, wow, I got the best lawyer, Sheldon Goldberg, the best lawyer. Well, ultimately, Sheldon, my understanding was that he, um, I mean, he was, he was, had a number of problems with the law society, but he had, had also many problems in provincial court with judges who had, had reamed him out for some of his practices. And ultimately, he was facing 
some significant discipline, uh, maybe a, a suspension or disbarment, and he quit. Um, and he just disappeared, and it's, it's funny. He promised he, when he quit. He promised that he would not practice law or even apply to become a member of the Law Society until, I think, 2006 or 2013. It's got to be longer than that um, because he was practicing in 2006. Yeah, I think so, 2006 was when the decision so, was. But the point is that, you know, when, you, when you're when you suspended uh, and, or when you are, are disbarred or when you voluntarily quit practicing, um, the Law Society can can put obligations on you uh, that are are beyond what you would have as a normal citizen who had never been a lawyer before. You can't do anything that is even remotely close to being a lawyer. So you can't be a paralegal, for example. Uh, you can't uh, you can't work in a law office as an assistant uh, because the concerns. So you you know you're you're bound by either an order or an undertaking, depending on the circumstances, that prohibits you from doing anything lawyerly. Uh, not not every time, right? I mean, but this is what the law society does. So even if you quit being a lawyer, if you just decide, you know what, I'm not going to pay my fees, I'm not going to be, be a lawyer anymore, you'll end up being sent one of these undertakings that you've got to you've got to comply with. And if you don't comply with it, then, well, you've got bigger problems coming. So, you know, there's all sorts of strange obligations that lawyers have, and this is one of them. And so he is bound by this and shows up in court on a photo radar ticket? On a photo radar ticket? But Paul, Sheldon Goldberg, in the BC Supreme Court, appeal, told the court he was the one that was driving the car, not Mr. Tran. So was he willing to just take the ticket then, or was he... No, no, he wanted to adjourn the matter um, because he had obtained relevant material from the Crown only a week earlier, um, which he says was the Crown's written argument and two authorities referred to in the argument... Um, and he says, the, and the Crown said they were only sending that material in response to Mr. Goldberg's position, which first appeared in his affidavits, where he swore that he was the driver, on November 18th and November 23rd. And the judge was like, well, that doesn't warrant an adjournment. If you take a position late, then... You just did it. It doesn't warrant an adjournment, but <laughs> you, you're not... You but, he's, but he's appearing as agent. He's not going to be he's compelled to... He's agent, yes. Yeah. So the court looks at at whether or not he is essentially allowed to be agent in BC Supreme Court. <laughs> the court says... I would think that the court would not want to allow Sheldon Goldberg to do anything in BC Supreme Court, except maybe defend himself. And even then. <laughs> and even then, they'd be reluctant, true. Uh, he says, I am in agreement with the Crown's submission that Mr. Goldberg ought not to be the agent for Mr. Tran. The judicial justice below granted Mr. Goldberg the right to appear as agent. I do not know whether he would have done so had he been advised by Mr. Goldberg when Mr. Goldberg was in front of him that Mr. Goldberg was the driver of the car involved in this driving offense that is the car owned by Mr. Tran. And then the court says, Mr. Goldberg has a long history of dealing with the Law Society with respect to his status as a practitioner. As I read Section 15, Sub 3 of the Legal Profession Act addressing who can practice law, Given that Mr. Goldberg resigned his membership of the Law Society and the circumstances of him doing so, he cannot appear as agent today. As Mr. Tran's agent, he is, in my opinion, practicing law, albeit not for a fee, when he is not allowed to. Based on the reasoning in Dick and Section 15, Sub 3, I find that Mr. Goldberg is not an acceptable agent, and that's why he adjourned it. It's fascinating. Fascinating that Sheldon would have the uh, the, balls. <laughs> the balls to do it. If you want to, I don't like that as a gender term. Man up, well, we're talking have about the balls. Up and paying your tickets, um, so. The um, but he uh, he's not a you know he's not a a, a dumb guy. He's a smart guy. Uh, he's just got a very different perspective on things. And one thing that's arisen uh, in my mind uh, in with the schism that we've seen in North America with respect to. Uh, left and right under the Trump presidency, where you can be speaking to somebody who is a reasonable, rational person and yet find out that they hold what I would consider very unreasonable and irrational views. Um, and maybe this is a result of Facebook that we learn this or, or Twitter or what have you. Um, I just feel there's a lot of people that don't have horse sense. He comes at it from a very different perspective, a perspective that I wouldn't come at it from. He can rationalize it. He can explain it. I don't agree with it. 
Um, but that is, uh, that is his method. But of course now the fellow doesn't have anybody appearing in court for him. Mr. Tran, was it? Yes. So Sheldon's standing there and the judge is saying, you can't be the agent. And, and, but he, does he adjourn it? Does he? He adjourns it? it, yes. Yeah. So he must adjourn it for the sake of Mr. Tran to get a new lawyer or, or to get a lawyer. Or appear on his own. Or do behalf. something with it. Yeah. Okay. You get a lawyer or represent yourself, but you can't have Sheldon Goldberg represent you. One must wonder. One must wonder why anyone would do this on a ticket that doesn't show up on your record. Where you don't so get the point. Even, even Sheldon Goldberg, uh, you know, he was very successful and everybody assumed that he was quite wealthy because he was quite... Uh, you know, he had a, the, probably the busiest legal aid practice. If you're running two trials in two different courtrooms at the same time, then you're making double the money on your legal aid files that day. Um, and he rode his bike to court. He was very environmentally conscious, conscience, conscious uh, in that respect. Um, but um, one would think that he could have just afforded to pay the ticket, bearing in mind it doesn't show up on anybody's driving record, doesn't affect insurance, and has no implications negatively for anyone at any time. But it does have a negative implication for Sheldon because the Law Society is going to look at that and say, well, hang on, Sheldon, if you ever want to come back and be a lawyer. Something tells me that Sheldon's never going to be back being a lawyer. Probably not. Maybe he could link up with Sean Beaver in Alberta and they could move to the Cayman Islands and set up a paralegal firm. That would be great. Um, okay, so that was that case. And it doesn't give us enough time to talk about the driving while prohibited case that I wanted to talk about because we also have to talk about our ridiculous driver of the week. It's a good ridiculous driver of the week. I still think the Alberta Justice Minister should have been the Alberta, that we should have been the ridiculous driver of the week. Uh, and we actually this week probably had about five hours worth of stuff to discuss. So. Yes. We can leave your topic for next so week. So much that we kind of got in a fight over what to <laughs> talk about. Got in a fight about what to talk about, <laughs> which is a rare occasion, but we don't always get along. Um, in any event, the um, the Ridiculous Driver of the Week, tell us all about it, Kyla. The Ridiculous Driver of the Week. driver of the week. So you may have heard of him because he's somewhat notorious. Hmm. Does he is he also in politics? He's also in politics. Wow, is he also in a position of authority in a provincial government? He's also in a position of authority in a provincial government. In fact, he's the leader of a provincial government. Oh, did he also do something with an electronic device? Well, driving and then said it wasn't illegal. Oh my gosh. Yes. So Doug Ford, Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario. The, the like best part of this story is that Doug Ford was trying to be like, I guess, rehabilitating his completely tarnished reputation. Well, there's a fascinating thing that's happened during COVID. So various different governments have been trying to figure out, you know, do they have the public's the public on side, um, do, is the, do people, uh, are, are people with them in their, in their COVID, um, steps. And at the beginning of the pandemic, basically all, every government, but Alberta, um, seem in, in Canada seem to have, uh, the public supporting them. And, uh, the provincial government here in BC at a minority position was smart enough to call an election when everybody was quite sympathetic and wanted the stability of a, uh, of a um, the government continuing uh, when um, when uh, the federal government, when the liberals uh, called the election for their minority, they ended up back in a minority because the public attitude had shifted. And the public attitude now has shifted significantly. Um, interestingly, think of the decisions that were made here with respect to the public face. So in BC, John Horgan has not been the face of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. He's allowed uh, Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dix. And at the beginning, it looked great for Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dix. Everybody was very sympathetic. And I still am sympathetic. Uh, I think they're making tough decisions, difficult decisions, and they're making decisions as a government that was elected to make the decisions. And, and Bonnie Henry is making decisions that, considering the resources that they've got in her role. 
But Hinshaw in Alberta, oh, she's really not liked. Uh, and, uh, of course, Jason Kelly is now in the absolute dumps. And Kenny was the one who stuck himself out there every day in front of the cameras. And same with Ford. And now Ford... Has lost stuck a lot. He stuck himself in front of the camera, that's for sure. Yeah, well, this time he stuck himself in front of the camera in his car. Yeah, and he was to trying give to... an interview, trying to be a regular guy. Trying to be a regular guy, get his old, like, Dougie's a man of the people. You can have my cell phone number. You could text me. You could call me. I'll talk to you. I'm a one of the people. I'm one of you. I did meth with my brother, just like you. Um, I drove down, the, <laughs> drove down the 401 in a snowstorm with a beer in my hand. Just like you. Text, uh, texting my buddies. No, so he, he's trying to, like, rehab his reputation by... In that driving, awful, by showing himself driving. ...awful snowstorm that Ontario had this last week. Um, and going around, digging people out. Oh, I'm going to help you. I'll dig you out. I'll dig you out. I'll dig you out of the snow. And what does he do? The news gets wind of it because obviously his, like, press team told him, oh, Dougie's out there saving the people. Um, and they call him for interviews. And he FaceTime interviews them while actively driving in a snowstorm. Not just regular old using your cell phone in a school zone. In a snowstorm. Yeah. Um, the shoveling snow thing can get you some real good cred. Yeah. Uh, Mike Farnworth was was uh, observed shoveling the snow for all of his neighbors a couple of years he? ago. But Mike and, Farnworth, why and, didn't and, you come shovel my walks? And, and I did I don't think it was I don't think it was planned that it made it in the news. Mike Farnworth I think does not listen he, to this podcast. He, he was not he's been on the podcast, but yeah, he doesn't he listen doesn't, to it. He doesn't listen uh, to podcasts. Yeah. yeah. Um so the uh the uh this was a, the active attempt to curry uh a good good feelings, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, boy, did it, uh, that backfired. And then when you see him in the snow, uh, aside from the fact that he looks like he's going to have a heart attack, he's got a little shovel that you use to sort of cut the edge of your, uh, of your grass where it runs up against your sidewalk. So it's one of those little cutting shovels. It's not actually a decent snow shovel. It's not a, like a rounded spade. It's a flat edged blade type shovel. I don't know what he was doing. He certainly wasn't assisting anybody. No. But talking on his phone while driving, looking at his phone, on because it's a, like a, a Zoom or FaceTime thing. Uh, and he didn't know how to use a laptop a year ago, but apparently now he knows. Oh, he does how to FaceTime, now, how to on, his FaceTime on his phone. Anyway, while driving and breaking the law. Will he get a ticket? Board. No. If he does get a ticket, then uh, he can just phone the chief of police. <laughs> All right. Well, that's our podcast. If you have a driving law related issue or if you got a distracted driving ticket in a school zone, a snowstorm or any other circumstance, you can give us a call at 604-685-8889 or find us online at VancouverCriminalLaw.com and tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law.